Welcome to this video concentrating on the seismic behavior of built cultural heritage objects. After a brief introduction, we will look at the seismic behavior of built heritage. Then we will go over some typical examples of damage due to earthquakes. And finally, we will draw some conclusions. The most significant parameters of dynamic loading influencing structural response are amplitude, frequency, or more precisely the frequency context of the signal, and naturally the duration of the motion. These determine the level of damage that could be inflicted upon a structure. Earthquake resistant design enables conferring buildings or structures with the ability to withstand the sudden ground shaking characteristics of earthquakes, thereby minimizing structural damage, human deaths and injuries. Suitable construction methods are required to ensure that proper design objectives for earthquake resistance are met. Earthquake resistant designs typically incorporate ductility into the structure and its structural members. Ductility is the ability of a building to bend, sway and deform without collapsing. A ductile building is able to bend and flex when exposed to the horizontal or vertical shear forces of an earthquake. Historical, especially masonry buildings, which are normally brittle, can be made ductile by adding some reinforcement. In such buildings with reinforced masonry, both materials should be precisely manufactured to achieve the desired ductile behavior. Building failures during earthquakes are often due to poor construction methods or inadequate materials. In historical zones, material was often not properly chosen or even unavailable, non-consolidated or cured to achieve its intended comprehensive strength, so buildings were thus extremely susceptible to failure under seismic loading. This problem is often made worse by the lack of local building codes or an absence of inspection and quality control. Monument buildings are structures that have important cultural and historical value, namely their testimony of ancient times which deserves to be preserved. Historical masonry buildings have cultural value as a whole. Built cultural heritage is at risk due to man-made and natural hazards. The seismic vulnerability of ancient masonry buildings is particularly difficult to assess and requires specialized technical skills. The key aspects are the material properties, the morphology of the structural elements, including connections between structural elements, the stiffness of horizontal diaphragms, and the building condition. The structural response of historical buildings to earthquakes is manifold and complex. This response does not only depend on the type of earthquake wave, amplitude, frequency and ground type, but also strongly depends on the type of structure and its design and performance features. Horizontal seismic forces are reversible in direction. Structural elements such as walls, beams and columns that were bearing only vertical loads before the earthquake now have to carry horizontal bending and shearing effects as well. When the bending tension due to an earthquake exceeds the vertical compression, net tensile stress occurs. The response of vertical elements under earthquake loads depends on many factors. The crucial parameters derive from the type of construction, connection to other elements and the materials used. With respect to mechanical strength, for example compressive strength, the three groups of historical materials form three more or less distinct categories with increasing strength characteristics in terms of compressive strength. Earth, brick, stone. Vertical elements, such as walls and pillars, carry the dead loads and they transfer horizontal loads and actions to the foundations. However, the contribution of horizontal structural elements such as floors, roofs and vaults to the seismic response of existing buildings is of primordial importance. Actually, the horizontal structural members affect the overall deformability of a structure, as well as the distribution of seismic actions both among the vertical structural elements according to their in-plane stiffness and across the vertical structural elements according to the boundary conditions. Seismic action on individual elements can be used for assessment only rarely, as they are usually interconnected with other members like ceilings, walls, columns, etc. These are complex structures thus having not only bending moments, but also other internal forces that completely change design and assessment procedures. For example, a system of walls connected to a floor with high stiffness is loaded differently than due to bending moments along the planar dimension. Drastic pictures of damage can be seen in the media after an earthquake strikes. 
Usually, as the vibration attack is complex, the total collapse of some buildings can be observed, as they are loaded by moments and shear forces and an out-of-plane load, as can be seen in some experimental results. These experiments can be done in the laboratory using so-called shaking tables. These are heavy platforms usually able to reproduce motion with six degrees of freedom, three lateral movements and three axial rotations, where the load is controlled by hydraulics and computers. Control damage can be carried out on such laboratory mock-up structures as well as testing the reliability of retrofits. During an earthquake in 1997, much similar damage arose due to inappropriate connections, or linkage, between individual structural elements. This example shows the overturning of lateral facade walls. Here we see the collapse of 17 five-story residential buildings. This is an example of collapse due to poor construction and shoddy materials, inadequate structural configuration and unpredictable failure due to so-called soil liquefaction. The area is considered practically aseismic. An earthquake occurred in the regions of Umbria and Marche in central Italy on the 26th of September 1997. It was preceded by a foreshock almost as strong as the main quake. Such repeated shock can be detrimental to the state of buildings especially when they have poor quality masonry, usually due to inadequate resistance. Improper bonding, low quality or missing plaster, and inadequate previous interventions. Earthquake-induced inertia force can be distributed to the vertical structural elements in proportion to their stiffness, provided the roofs and floors are rigid and act as horizontal diaphragms. Otherwise, the roof and floor inertia will only be transferred to the vertical elements on which they are supported. Therefore, the stiffness and the integrity of roofs and floors are important for earthquake resistance. In some cases, like in the pictures here, inadequate stiffening of part of the building, in comparison with other materials, can cause high stresses in other parts that cannot bear the transferred loading and stresses. A first general lesson should be learned. The execution of interventions that locally change the stiffness of the structure has to be adequately evaluated. The second general lesson is then, retrofitting can help to contain earthquake damage to built heritage. It aims to reach an appropriate level between acceptable and excessive damage, but specific attention has to be paid to conservation principles. In conclusion, we can say that the response of buildings to earthquakes depends on the characteristics of the construction, the quality of materials used, and of course, the strength of the earth movement itself, including liquefaction. Past interventions are sometimes revealed as being inadequate in the light of earthquakes. However, they provide us with information on which to set better standards for design as well as for retrofitting. A golden rule for built heritage objects is this. If possible, a building should be retrofitted in such a way that it exhibits rigid box-like behavior assuring that all elements, such as the walls and roof, be tied together so as to act as an integrated unit during earthquake shaking transferring forces across connections and preventing separation. Thank you for your attention.